Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. Welcome. Thank you for joining the Niwot Historical Society's Now and Then Lecture Series. We're honored to have Bob Crefazi with us this evening, and Leonard will uh, introduce him. Thank you again. I hope you enjoy the video. Welcome. I met Bob through a mutual friend when we were hiking in southern Colorado. When we hit on the topic of ditches in Niwot, in the Niwot area, I quickly realized he knows a lot about it. Bob has previously worked as an environmental planner for the Denver Water and served for many years as the Water Resources Administrator for the City of Boulder, Open Space and Mountain Parks. He served on 11 ditch companies and was president of several. From his intellectual curiosity and interaction with a lot of people who've had lifetimes of knowledge of water and the West, Bob has become a well-known source for facts, history, and stories. His education includes master's degrees in geology and environmental science. That and 25 years of water resource management make him ideal for understanding and lecturing about this history. Bob has written a very good book about how the appropriation and development of water and repairing resources in Colorado has changed the face of the Front Range. An area that was once a desert is now an irrigated oasis suitable for habitation and supporting millions of people. The title is A Land Made from Water, and it's a thorough description of how continent-wide factors resulting from the western expansion of the U.S. impacted this small part of the nation, yet resulted in law and politics that have affected the USA forevermore. This book is very enjoyable reading. It's not a dry recitation of the history of water law. It's a wide-ranging storytelling about the people, the land, and the water. You can understand that Bob is eminently qualified to give this lecture for the Niwot Historical Society. We are fortunate that he has taken the time. Please sit back and enjoy this informative and engaging lecture from Desert to Oasis, A Land Made from Water. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. I appreciate being here. I enjoy talking about water, and uh, this is a, a, a community that I really like. Left Hand Ditch Company has its offices just around the com uh, corner here. I've been in ditch meetings in this very building, so uh, this is like home turf for me. So I'm in going to enjoy being here this evening. Uh, what I'll talk about tonight is some of the stuff that is in my book, but a little bit more and slightly different uh, from what Leonard described. And the title of uh, the presentation tonight is From Desert to Oasis, A Landscape of Change. And what I will be going over is what I would say is my main thesis here, is that we can get a better sense of Colorado's development by seeing it from the long-term perspective of how people have interacted with the environment and how the environment has impacted the decisions that people make. It's all intertwined and a lot of the decision-making that people have made over the last 150 years is a response to the environment that uh, we have here. So I'll start a little bit with the course of development. 
But I'll tell you a little bit about this drawing here first because it's a pretty cool one. Um, a fellow by the name of Elliot was a member of the Hayden Expedition. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Hayden Expedition, Vandermeer Hayden, they um, <clears throat> are some of the federal geologists and uh, surveyors that explored the West with part of the four great uh, American uh, surveys of the 19th century. There was the Hayden Survey, Powell's famous survey, King and Wheeler. The Hayden Survey is probably best known for discovering, uh, or rather describing, the geysers and some of the other features in the Yellowstone Basin. But a fewer people realize that they came down and spent a lot of time on the Front Range. And these drawings by Elliot uh, are of this area. If you take a look at this drawing, you'll see Haystack Butte over there on the far right. And this was drawn in 1869 and before any photographs of the area are known. So this is one of the few, few uh, images to show what the left-hand area looked like before there was really any development. <clears throat> but first, let's set the stage a little bit. Before even the white man came on the scene, they, we had the Native Americans, and they had been here for arguably 10 to 17,000 years, somewhere in that range. They found the Mahaffey Catch up uh, in Chautauqua Park several years ago that goes back to the late Pleistocene. And they had uh, our, these points that are of Clovis-type points had camel, horse, other uh, megafauna that were then made extinct in North America. So going back that far, we had people changing the landscape and actively doing things out here on the Front Range. And so they were burning, they were hunting, they were manipulating the land for many thousands of years. We just don't have a written record of that, so it's hard to understand all of the changes that they wrought. Of course, later on, you had uh, Cortez coming into Mexico, and then in 1540 and 41, Coronado came up the Rio Grande to uh, New Mexico, and then had their epic journey across the High Plains, and they ended up roughly where Omaha is today, near the mouth of the Platte and Mississippi, Missouri rivers. And they brought about change, the Hispanic people. They had their water management systems. Uh, eventually, horses escaped. So that gave rise to the Plains Indian horse culture and all of that. So we had a lot of things going on through uh, those centuries where our riparian system and front range started to change in response to these human uh, factors. By around the early 19th century, we started to have many of the fur traders come into the Boulder Valley, into the Front Range. Uh, Saran St. Vrain is probably the best known. He was part of uh, the St. Vrain and Bent's enterprise. They built Bent's Fort down on the Arkansas, and St. Vrain's Fort at the mouth of the uh, St. Vrain Creek after Saran. Uh, and uh, the Platte River, South Platte River. And that was an enterprise working through the 1830s. And they were collecting uh, furs from the various trappers and sending them back east or via Bent's Fort. They were also getting furs from the Indians in trade. And there were a lot of um, trading going on Along the Platte River, you had Fort Lupton and some of the other forts that were taking the various peltries and uh, hides that were being collected here and then sending them east. So that was part of the modifications that started to occur. We don't usually think of the Front Range as being one of those centers for the fur trade because it was so early. A lot of the action moved to the north west up onto the Green River and Columbia later, but this area was heavily trapped in the early 19th century. 
We also had a lot of buffalo. When um, John C. Fremont came through Bent's Fort, they discussed how many buffalo were, were on the high plains here. Those animals started to get trapped out. We, you know, in east, from, from here, east at Niwot, uh, there were herds of buffalo, as far as the eye could see, uh, heading out onto the high plains. Fremont came up the South Platte again through uh, uh, St. Vrain's Fort and where the REI store is in downtown Denver today, they were attacked by a grizzly bear. So it's a really fascinating story about how this was a, uh, for the white men at least, a wilderness. It was pretty rugged terrain. There were wolves, there were, there were grizzly bears, there were buffalo uh, and a lot of other megafauna here. Of course, once the, the whites got here, they started to hunt a lot of this stuff out uh, very judiciously, and that started to change the land and water resources from how we see it today. So here's a couple of slides. <clears throat> Fort Lupton on the South Platte River, Bent's Fort, just to kind of illustrate that. Those structures still stand. There were other, other forts uh, along the way and other kinds of activities occurring here. Now, one of the big changes that happened, as you all know, I'm sure, in the audience here, we had the gold rush that um, uh, made Colorado famous. 1858, uh, on the Platte River, South Platte River in Denver, they started to find some gold, and then they went up on Clear Creek and found uh, the first big placer deposits there. Within a few months, they were finding gold in the foothills up here near Gold Hill. So there was a, the rush was on. And many, many people started to go up into the foothills to, to get the gold. But what was also occurring is, is that a lot of people were coming in and realizing that the money to be made wasn't necessarily in gold, but it was in supplying the miners that were up in the mountains. And that wasn't just pots and pans and mining equipment. They needed food. They needed uh, mules to carry ore and to work the mines, and those, those mules needed hay. And so some of the earliest settlers in Boulder Valley uh, were actually collecting hay and sending it up to Gold Hill and up to Central City. So there was a lot going on there. Very rapidly, we saw some of the creeks uh, get settled. 1859, Boulder Creek, Left Hand Creek in 1860 were the first home setters. Coal Creek, 1859, South Boulder Creek, 1860. So very rapidly, they started to uh, create farms in the bottomlands along the South Platte and then up into these various tributaries like Boulder Creek and so on. <clears throat> I have a couple of fo uh, photos here. You can see the McGinn Homestead. They were uh, amongst the first people on South Boulder Creek to build ditches. And as you could see, it was a log cabin. Um, very, uh, very rugged living back then. The other photo is of the head-gated Howard Ditch which is near South Boulder Road and South Boulder Creek. You could go out there today and see that. If you were to go out there now, all you'd see is homes and trees and that sort of thing. It's, it's in the south part of Boulder. Now here's the uh, earliest known map that I am aware of of Boulder. And this one was made around 1863 and it was created by the General Land Office, the precursor to the Bureau of Land Management. And they went around this area mapping so that they could identify resources and also uh, uh, record land claims. So this was before the land was even uh, ceded to the United States by the Indian treaties. So they, anybody out here at this time were squatting on Indian land. Yet the government did come out here and start to um, uh, map and identify features and things like that. And what you could see is, is this is uh, Boulder Creek and on the west side, the left, you can see the town site for the city of Boulder and there are various channels of South Boulder Creek and I'll be getting back to that. I just want to point that out. 
you'll see the main channel of, and it's called North Boulder Creek. We just call it Boulder Creek today. But then there's a little channel just to the north of that that becomes important in the story a little later. Uh, and that's because they were starting to build ditches and people wanted to save in labor. So rather than uh, just dig a ditch, they would use the various side channels or meander loops of the various creeks to start their ditches. If it could save them a half a mile of digging, well, that was a lot of labor. So they were doing that. And that was one of the ways that they were interacting with the environment and the environment was affecting their decision making. So they started in the bottomlands. They started claiming land in the bottomlands, like the Wellman brothers and some of the other, other families that were acquiring land. And they started to uh, make claims all the way out to where Longmont is today, and all along the creek. Within just a few years, all the good bottomlands were taken. There were a lot of ditches already being constructed along the bottomlands, and they started to realize that there was a, a limit for development unless something else could be done. So a couple of the settlers started to think, hey, you know, we're building these ditches. The creek has a certain gradient, and if we build a ditch that has a lesser gradient, you could wind a ditch along until it gets to the top of these terraces that we have around here. So um, uh, that's exactly what they did. Uh, the fellow that built the South Boulder and Bear Creek ditch is probably the first one to have done that. But in short order, other people started to dig ditches off onto the terraces. Here is uh, a uh, photograph of the construction of Davidson Ditch when they were building it out onto the terraces there. Marshall is out in the background of this picture. So this gets really important for Western development in general because in this area was the first time that people started to build ditches and bring them out onto the terraces to irrigate land. And uh, William Davidson here was in the forefront of that for being one of the great entrepreneurs of the 19th century because he realized that if he dug a ditch and brought it out onto one of the terraces but bought the land out there first, he could have a great opportunity for a real estate development. And if you build a ditch, you can have land irrigated and then start selling irrigable parcels to prospective uh, immigrants. Uh, you can build a ditch for $14,000 like he did, market the shares for $28,000, and then start selling the land that he got for $1.50 an acre for a couple of hundred dollars an acre and start selling land. So they started to buy land and uh, couple that with ditch development. And right after he did this, the uh, farmer's ditch uh, in North Boulder was built and they brought water out to North Boulder to do that. And so the race was on to get land up on these terraces and start developing it for prospective farmers. Within a few years, all of the good terraces near the mouth of the canyon were uh, taken. And as part of this progression from bottomlands to terraces, in order to get to further out lands, they had to start building the ditches further and further up into the high country. Now, if you think about the logic of building ditches, it's sure a lot easier to do it out on the bottomlands where it's flat and then just uh, uh, dig a ditch there. <clears throat> you come a little closer to the mouth of the canyon and then you move it along and you can get it onto the terraces there. Well, Silver Lake Ditch, and we have uh, Jim Snow in the audience here tonight looking at this, know, knowingly looking at this photograph. This is the construction of Silver Lake Ditch at about 1890. And if anybody uh, is familiar with Boulder Canyon, you go up north towards Elephant Buttress, you'll see a pipeline snaking along the side of the hill, and that's the uh, Silver Lake Ditch as it is today. But in 1890, there were several people that were starting to build this entrepreneurial uh, um, ditch company, 
and uh, uh, James P. Maxwell was the principal in this, and he became an interesting guy at part of the water development story in the United States. He, he built the ditch, but he also built several reservoirs in what later became the Boulder Watershed, Silver Lake uh, Reservoir, and then out at the end of the ditch, uh, Mesa Reservoir. And so by building reservoirs at the, in the watershed up in the high country and then a, uh, another reservoir down at the end of the ditch, he could actually have a ditch system where you're coordinating the water use up and down the ditch and distributing it. One of the things that he did that was different from the other ditches is that rather than selling the land, which he did some of that, but they mostly kept the shares of water and leased them to prospective farmers over long-term leases. So that was a slightly different thing. So now we have a progression that goes from the bottomlands to the terraces and up into the, up into the foothills. Well, around the same time, and actually in the early 1860s, one of the things that occurred was they're starting to appropriate this water. And as more people started to appropriate water, they started to realize that by late August, early August at some times, there was insufficient water to bring your food crops to fruition. You couldn't grow a tomato if there wasn't any water in August. So they started to build artificial lakes and the first artificial lake was down, uh, down in what's now Westminster, uh, over there at Church Lake, I believe it's, it is. The second lake that was built in the uh, Denver metropolitan area was Pancost Reservoir in 1863, and that's out where the power, Belmont Power Plant is today. <clears throat> They've enlarged those lakes over the years, so the Pan original Pancost Reservoir is underwater under other lakes. But anyhow, um, Pancost built a little ditch from South Boulder Creek and started to move water out onto uh, his reservoir. They put sunfish in there and they were harvesting those and selling those to miners. They were also irrigating and, and building a pretty good livelihood. So as the water development got, uh, started to progress, they realized, okay, we can start building these artificial lakes, which of course we know as reservoirs today. And as time went on, they started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, back to the ditches. So as they started to march up the canyons to look for more water, people started to think, hey, why don't we take water from the West Slope? That's not very developed. And so some of the very first uh, transcontinental diversions uh, were proposed in this area. The first trans-basin diversion was the Left Hand Ditch Company, and that brought water from South St. Vrain River over to Jim Creek, which was into Left Hand Creek, <clears throat> and that was in 1863. A few years later, uh, there were some proposals to bring uh, ditches across the Continental Divide. Not much occurred. Then uh, the Grand Ditch was built in the 1890s in what's now Rocky Mountain National Park. They brought uh, headwaters of the Colorado over to the Front Range. And then up on the top of South Boulder Creek, they started to build what's now known as the Moffat Tunnel. And what they did there is, is um, Moffat wanted to build a railroad tunnel uh, through the mountains. Of course, they have the Rollins Pass was where the railroad occurred. And it was um, snowing in in the winter. It was very hard operationally for a railroad. And so they built the Moffat Tunnel, but before they built the railroad tunnel, they built the pilot bore of the railroad tunnel that was 12 feet in diameter that comes out over at what's uh, now Winter Park. And Denver, the city of Denver, purchased uh, uh, the rights to run water through that. And that's when they started to divert water out of the Fraser Basin and down to Denver through the Moffat Tunnel, and they took it off of South Boulder Creek and then moved it down to Denver. So that was in the uh, 1920s, and here's a photograph of the, op of the construction of the tunnel. <clears throat> then uh, in the night, a little later, the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District, which was a federal program, 
uh, run by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and the, the Conservancy District, they started to also look at projects to divert Colorado River water over to the Front Range. And so they built um, Grand Lake and the reservoirs there, a tunnel, the Alva B. Adams Tunnel, under the Continental Divide, underneath Rocky Mountain National Park, to go over towards Horsetooth Reservoir, and then they started to distribute that water down the South Platte. The Boulder Feeder Canal, which leads into uh, Boulder Reservoir, was constructed in the 50s to take Colorado River water down to Boulder, and an extension of that canal goes all the way out to Brighton. So that was a very big project that <clears throat> allowed uh, further development in uh, in the Front Range, including here uh, near Niwot and Longmont. <clears throat> so there were a lot of things going on there. Initially, it was private capital that was building these things. The pioneer ditches that were being done by individuals. <clears throat> by the time you had Davidson come along, he started to raise capital so that they could hire people to build ditches. And so there was a progression there. They were getting bigger and bigger ditches. It started to require more and more capital. Before long, they started to um, have stock <clears throat> sales where they were selling shares to people in the East Coast in as far away as England. Uh, the English company up on uh, near Fort Collin is still called that because they had raised money from uh, European capitals. Uh, so there's you know money that was good entrepreneurial money was coming in. <clears throat> Initially also, like Pancost, he was just doing it on his own. But before long to build a reservoir, the money was starting to get pretty big. And uh, Stanley Reservoir is an example of that. That was private capital. That's Stanley Reservoir is down in what's now Arvada. And you can see, you know, they have a little railroad uh, being built there and, and they were bringing it in and filling it. Long story there, uh, some of the people that helped design the Panama Canal were involved with the design of Stanley Lake. So there were some really interesting things going on there. And Colorado was a real uh, hotbed for innovation for ditches and reservoirs. But eventually the cost to build uh, reservoirs started to get beyond what even private capital can do. And that's when um, you know, in, in the late 19th century, Powell, uh, John Wesley Powell, had uh, encouraged that the United States get into reclamation. Uh, at, shortly after he died, the United States uh, passed the Newlands Act, which created the Bureau of Reclamation. So the federal government started to get into uh, ditch and reservoir construction big time. That's how the Bureau of Reclamation came about. But also, you had um, municipalities getting into the act as well. Here's a photograph of Gross Reservoir, which was constructed in 1950, and that was built by the Denver Water Board to bring water over to Denver. So now that they had the Moffat Tunnel, they then had a 41,000 acre foot reservoir up there in the mountains west of Boulder that they could store that water in, and then they could divert it out and bring it down to Denver. So that accounts for about 25% of the city of Denver's water supply today. So it's a very important structure. Anyhow, they, they were doing um, uh, this progression from small projects to big, from the plains to the mountains and so on. And that's what this, this slide uh, um, encapsulates. You have the started at the bottomlands, then you got into the closely in reservoirs, I mean terraces. Then you started to do little reservoirs started to go further up into the mountains. Eventually, you had corporate dishes. Then you had trans-basin diversions, then reclamation and, and municipal projects. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a juggernaut of water development that occurred. There was a lot more going on between that and just water development, because water development was inextricably tied with all of the other kind of activities that was occurring on the Front Range. We had railroads. We had timber extraction, we had agriculture, we had coal mining. And all of that was part of Colorado's early economy. Here is a Davidson stock certificate that incorporates all of those things in one stock certificate. And I love it for that because what you have here is, if you look where it says Davidson 
uh, uh, coal and mining company. <clears throat> and Davidson crossed it out and said Davidson Ditch. <laughs> so he took the stock certificate and he, from his mining company and um, crossed it out and put it as a ditch company. So here you have the coal uh, linking with the water and agriculture. And if you look uh, to see who the owner of that stock certificate is and squint a bit, you'll see it's uh, William A. H. Loveland, uh, who uh, founded the town of Loveland. And of course, for those of you that know a little bit about Loveland, he was involved with the railroad construction, and he was also one of uh, General Palmer's early investors for the coal mines in southern Colorado and for the coal mining in this area as well. So here you have encapsulated in one stock certificate the uh, early uh, or Colorado economy. And, and so there's a real story in that if you look through these things. So I mentioned, you know, the ditches going from small, small ditches to big affairs. Many aspects of the early Colorado economy mimicked that. Labor went from being pretty um, specialized. You know, you're building your own ditch and all of that. But eventually it became very specialized. Instead of being a yeoman farmer, you started to become a farmer that was uh, growing commodity crops. Instead of being a placer miner, suddenly you were a hired laborer at a, uh, a gold mine. And so the nature of the labor force in Colorado shifted as well with this development. Here's an example of that, Russell Gulch, which was where they found the first gold up on Clear Creek. A lot of individuals uh, doing some uh, placer mining in flumes. You see one of these old wooden flumes. And by around 1890, 1900, they're doing high velocity hoses to wash down whole hillsides uh, with hydraulic mining. And this was a huge industrialized affair beyond the ability of individual miners. So it was a real shift. By this point in time, you could, it didn't pay to be an individual miner. You had to be part of a mining company to succeed. <clears throat> and then by the 1940s, they were into hard rock mining. Uh, so that continued that progression as well. Now I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about uh, some of the early history. I talked about appropriation. And early on, I talked a little bit about uh, the Native Americans and, and how they were here. <clears throat> and I really didn't get into this piece of history, and it's one of the darker aspects, in my view, of Colorado history. And that is when the first settlers came to this area, 18, late 1850s, early 1860s, this was Indian land. The Fort Laramie Treaty had recognized that from the North Platte River down to the Arkansas, that it would be the land of the Cheyenne and Arapaho forever. And they discovered gold, and people came in and started to dig the mines and, and create the farms. Morse Coffin, uh, who had a farm out on St. Frank Creek, east of uh, Longmont, had reminiscences that he published in the early 1900s, and those are really interesting reads. And one of the things he pointed out at that time is, of course, the first settlers in this whole region were squatters on Indian lands. They knew it. They, they were uh, very aware that this uh, history, uh, that this was Indian land titled lands. And so if they wanted to secure title to their farms and ditches and mineral resources and trees, they had to do something about the Indians. Of course, the Indians saw it as their homeland and where they wanted to be. Um, but what happened was in, in 1864, Governor Evans, our second territorial governor, authorized the raising of United States cavalry and granted in part of his proclamation that they keep all plunder taken from the Indians. And the fellow that became uh, in charge of that uh, group was uh, Colonel uh, John Shivington. 
And there were uh, various uh, uh, units raised up and down the Front Range from St. Vrain Creek, Left Hand Creek, the uh, Boulder Creek, uh, and they went and joined Shivington's unit at Sand Creek. Uh, I'll relate a very, uh, uh, very sad experience for me. When I first got on to the Anderson Ditch Board, <clears throat> I was asked to be on that board in the first season out there. We came down and walked along the Anderson Ditch and walked into Columbia Cemetery. And out there along on Columbia Cemetery is a military tombstone just six feet from the bank of Anderson Ditch. And on the bank, it's, it's right there, Jonah Anderson, and uh, who's the guy that founded Anderson Ditch. Well, I'm looking at it, and I had just finished reading uh, Elliot West's wonderful book um, about the gold rush, uh, and I had been aware of the Sand Creek Massacre. And so when I looked at his tombstone, I saw 3rd Colorado Cavalry, and I knew immediately, my goodness, this guy was part of the Shivington campaign against the Indians. And so it struck me, and it struck me hard, that here I am on a ditch board who was founded by somebody who had murdered Indians at the worst massacre, perhaps, in the United States history of Indian affairs. So that was you know, just a really hard thing to, to grapple with. But that really set me uh, in a decade-long interest to kind of research this grim history and understand it a little bit more. So what I went out and I got lists of the uh, members of the various units for the uh, Shivington, uh, various Shivington um, units that were involved with the massacre. And I started to compare them against the founders of various ditch companies in Boulder and Left Hand Valley. And I found that, uh, to my horror, uh, that many of the people who founded the ditches in Boulder were also, uh, in one way or another, involved with the massacre. Jonah Anderson, uh, Green, who founded Green Ditch. Uh, David Nichols uh, was involved with uh, one of the ditches, uh, the Boulder and White Rock. Uh, Arbuthnot, who had uh, uh, been up here on Left Hand Ditch. Uh, many of these, and many, many more, were involved. Uh, they trained out near um, 63rd and Boulder Creek. They had a little fort there and went out to there. Uh, when I uh, went out to Sand Creek, I learned that uh, descendants of Jonah Anderson had repatriated a scalp that he had taken at the massacre, and it was buried out there in the Indian Cemetery. So it was really an awful thing. Um, some of the members from these units had taken scalps and traded them for shoes in Denver. So it was, you know, just a grim, grim experience. What they did, though, was, is uh, moving on, because I know it's a little harsh talking about that. What they did was, is they converted land that was of Indian title into the lands that we see as Colorado. Fort Laramie Treaty, 1851, Fort Wise, which uh, allowed uh, some of the mines to be part of, uh, you know, to be, to be utilized. Um, the Pacific Railway Act of July 1, 1862, signed by Abraham Lincoln, made it United States policy to um, uh, extinguish titles to the Indians along railroad uh, lands. And that's right there in the act. Uh, the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864. Uh, Medicine Lodge Treaty was pretty critical because that's the one that uh, the Indians finally ceded all the land of northeastern Colorado to the federal government. Now remember, um, uh, John Evans had been the territorial governor. And uh, lo and behold, he becomes a railroad man. He was a railroad man. And within two years of that land being transferred to the federal government, uh, some of the railroads, the Denver Pacific, which he was an owner in, got these big railroad grants. So as soon as the la railroad lands moved over to the private sector, some of the uh, oligarchs of early Colorado were able to then get title to the lands that were formerly Indian lands. And so it goes. Now, here's, here's the uh, Kansas Pacific Railway showing all of that 
land. Now you may be wondering, why am I showing you this as part of a, uh, a talk about water? Well, it's really interesting because what they did was, is they took the land that was Indian land and then put it into either private hands directly or via the railroads. The railroads then had this cornucopia of land in eastern Colorado that they then started to do what William Davidson did, is they started to build large ditches and uh, then sell that land and water to the various farmers that were coming out. So that's where all of the big development out near Fort Lupton and um, Fort Morgan and all of that on the High Plains really took off after these privatizations of land. Uh, Longmont was uh, land that had been privatized this way, Greeley Colony as well. So, so a lot of the things that we uh, have here were occurring at that time. Our riparian resources weren't just uh, impacted by uh, the, the ditches, but there was a huge effort to take trees out of the high country. They were doing tie drives in these mountains. Up in Wyoming, it really happened in a big way to get ties, and what I mean by ties is railroad ties. They were bringing those down and using that to construct um, uh, the railroads. On South Boulder Creek and in the mountains west of here, they were actively taking ties out, and one of the big people that were involved with that, in fact, where he made a lot of his money was Moffat, and he made some of his early money not building the rail, not, well, not owning the railroad, but supplying the railroad ties to the railroad. And so they were taking that out. And here's a photograph of uh, uh, them throwing logs in one of the front range streams to bring it down to the front. Here's a photograph of one of the ties, tie drives, uh, and you could see all of that lumber coming down from uh, the mountains. And if anyone recognizes those hills, I would love, I've been trying to figure out which hills those are. So if you see that and you recognize it, I'd love to go back to that spot and try and take a photograph of that sometime. So by the late 19th century, 1883, what was the, the agriculture department, had done a survey of um, lumber resources along around Colorado and they found that between one-third to three-quarters of all trees in Larimer, Boulder, Gilpin, Clear Creek, Jefferson, Douglas, El Paso, Fremont Lake, Park, and Chafee counties had been removed. So the gold rush was in 1859 and by 1883 this enormous amount of lumber had been taken for railroad ties, for fence posts, for making uh, coke, uh, for charcoal, for building um, uh, the homes and such. So the whole watersheds uh, west of here started to transform. 1874, another thing occurred that had major implications for the transformation of the landscape, including the riparian zones. Because with the introduction of barbed wire, you could now have cheap fences that could impose the Cartesian order uh, of township range and sections, the Jeffersonian uh, coordinate system, the Cartesian coordinate system of land ownership onto Colorado. And so instead of just having cattle wander where they would go, they would be confined to different sections and so on. And so that imprinted changes on the landscape and land and water resources as another layer of the, the progression of change that we, cha uh, that we did here. Moving on again, one of the things that was kind of a salient feature in 19th century America was the commodification of nature. Think of pork bellies and the uh, uh, grain uh, silos of the Midwest. That was all pork belly futures and grain, that was something that they came up with in order to have markets, commodity markets in Chicago, 
in order to move these commodities and take the bounty of the Great Plains and move it to the east. Uh, hides was another one. Uh, so all of these various natural products, they were commodifying. But how do you commodify water? If you want to commodify water, you have to measure it. A pork belly is a, is a pig. You, can, you, have, you have 100 pork bellies, you, you know what that represents. Uh, if you have certain grain qualities, you can you know, measure that in cubic feet. Water is an elusive thing. So there was a big need developed in the late 19th century for figuring out how do you measure the amounts of water that are moving down these creeks. And so there were a lot of early devices that started to get invented and ideas from Europe that were brought in to measure water so that you can say, oh, we have this amount of water for our water right, and if you want to buy and sell it, you have to be able to quantify it. So they had these early devices that they were using. It wasn't until uh, the um, first third of the 20th century when that became really refined with the work of Ralph Parshall. He was a, an engineering professor up at CSU, and he invented this particular flume that was coupled with a recorder device. So this flume, the only variable in there was the height of the water in the flume, and then he had a little drum rot uh, rotating around, and so you could measure water flowing uh, through time. And so you can figure out how many acre feet per day are going through your structure, and now you could start accurately measuring water. And then water rights administration became a lot more rational, and it became easier to buy and sell water rights. So water was finally a well-commodified product. <clears throat> Mentioned a little bit of this, but as water became a commodity, we also had the commodification of our uh, agriculture. Into the 20, early 20th century with the sugar beets, that was a commodity product. At one point, people were growing the food for themselves or for the mines. But once we had the railroads coming into Boulder uh, and Longmont, you could have these big farms that were growing sugar beets and exporting that to the East Coast uh, or Chicago. The railroads uh, started to uh, monopolize the transport of these commodity products. And so in response to that, you had buildings such as the one we're in get constructed. The Grange Halls, they were an uh, agrarian, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, labor union that was put up to make all these various Grange Halls around the Northern Front Range and into other states to organize farmers uh, so that they could have a way of pushing back against the railroads in terms of getting um, uh, money for the right amounts for their transportation. So you had these radicalization of the farmers so that they would get paid appropriate amounts of money for their product. And so that was uh, a, a little known piece of the Colorado puzzle as well. We had these radical farmers uh, doing things like uh, building uh, co-ops, which some would call socialistic today, uh, but they had these various grain co-ops, uh, which were just coordination between multiple farmers so that they could push back against other corporate interests and um, be able to make a living. So in the mid to late 19th century, Colorado also became a epicenter for hydraulic engineering expertise. James P. Maxwell, our friend that built uh, the Silver Lake ditch, he went on to become one of the state engineers for the state of Colorado. He wound up mapping um, Steamboat, town of Steamboat Springs. He was really well known amongst uh, water engineers. He was even uh, uh, issue, his photograph was even on issue one of Irrigation Age, uh, uh, Smythe's famous publication that publicized irrigation in the Western United States. So, so he became very famous. Elwood Mead was a young guy in the 1880s. I don't know if you, if you know who Elwood was. 
Uh, he started out measuring ditches for the state engineer on St. Vrain Creek, uh, up north, up near Fort Collins on Boulder and South Boulder Creeks. And he saw how people were managing water here. And then he eventually got a job as the state engineer in Wyoming. Uh, and he brought the prior appropriation system up to Wyoming and that got into their uh, constitution. And so they adopted um, prior appropriation. Elwood then went on to become um, the head of the United States Bureau of Reclamation. And there's a little lake named after him out in Nevada uh, called Lake Mead. Uh, and uh, that was a Colorado boy that got started here in uh, uh, the Front Range. So Now, another thing that occurred in the late 19th century, we had all of these great progress uh, with the you know, invention of the light bulb and you know, Tesla with the dynamo and all of that. So all of these things started to happen. They figured out how to electrify the East Coast by uh, having dynamos running at um, um, some of the big waterfalls, uh, in Niagara Falls and so on. Well, they started to adopt that uh, technology and do that in Colorado. So in the early 1900s, Barker Dam got constructed, uh, Shoshone out on uh, the Colorado River near Glenwood Springs. Those, those were built within a couple of years of each other to generate electricity. And so we went from just using water for agriculture in cities to now these industrial uses where we're diverting water out and generating electricity. Here's the Boulder Canyon hydroelectric project. This is uh, where they bring water down to um, the power plant in the canyon out of Barker Reservoir, and this is it under construction. So I'll move on to sort of the last part of my talk and kind of bring some of these ideas together into how we transform Colorado's landscape and looking at all of this stuff. Here's another image from our, our friend Elliot. And this one is uh, north, six miles north of Boulder. And those of you that know this area might recognize that as Table Mountain, where the radio antennas are. Uh, is that little platform, and this was roughly drawn, uh, drawn where Potato Hill is up in that area, looking south. And so, you know, not, there's nice, nice farms and such out of there uh, today. We had this whole program of diverting water, and I kind of described how that occurred. Well, that caused major, major changes. One of the things that the Hayden expedition noticed when they came down is that people started to say, you know, once we started to develop here, uh, water that used to dry up, these creeks that used to dry up, have more water in them, into them in the fall. And um, Samuel Augie uh, picked up on that idea and said, rain follows the plow. And, you know, if we develop the high plains, we're going to be able to get more and more water coming down because rain follows the plow. Well, well, to a lot of people's very bitter disappointment, rain does not follow the plow. Uh, and they found that out. What, what we've learned is, is that once you started to move all of that water out onto those terraces and irrigate, some of it soaks into the ground and then starts flowing back to the creek. And then the creek gets that water and it keeps flowing. What they noticed was is that Boulder Creek, St. Vrain Creek, Left Hand Creek, back in the 1860s, those would flow and out east past Port Lupton near Julesburg, the South Platte River went dry. And there are lots of uh, anecdotes and, and letters and things like that that talk about people digging into the dry bed of the South Platte River when uh, and during those years. But as time went on, there was more and more water in the tributaries and then finally down into the South Platte where they could actually start diverting water and building the big irrigation systems down there. And the uh, state engineer's office recognized that. And here's a really cool little chart from the Colorado State Engineer in 1929. Here is a chart 
And this is miles downstream from Denver. And here are flows in cubic feet per second, which is the number we use for managing, uh, uh, for, for watching flows. And at Denver, which is about here, you know, not a lot of flows. In the 1880s, the flow out near the Colorado state line had, uh, you know, um, five, six hundred CFS in it in the late spring. By the 1880s, the flow had consistently gone up to 800 or more CFS. By 1900, 1,100 cubic feet per second. By the 1920s, 1,400 cubic feet per second. And that's because as we reor reordered the hydrology in the area, that water, again, going out onto the terraces, and it takes time for it to soak back and get back to the channel. So this water that had come down really fast and dissipated was now in the channel of the South Platte longer and further out east. And so that had major impacts on how uh, the river looked. So here's a photograph from 1930 where Ralph Parshell, uh, the engineer who came up with the measuring device, estimated that nearly one million acre feet of return flows were reaching the lower part of the South Platte that hadn't been available before. And so all of that water development that occurred down there was because of that. A lot of the early settlers, and this is just something important to think about, they didn't just build farms going up the South Platte and then to the, to the foothills. They left eastern Nebraska and came all the way across the arid lands to the foothills and then settled. And then they started settling going back down the river. And as the ditches developed, it allowed them to start settling further and further east rather than coming up the river because there simply wasn't water in those creeks earlier. Here's a photograph down in central Nebraska on the main plat in 1866 right around when the Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed. And I love this photo because here's a fellow sitting out there uh, contemplating the South Platte River and behind him is a buffalo skull. And uh, you get a sense of what is going on out there. Well, move up a few years in time and here's an air photo of Kozad, Nebraska in 1979. In the 1860s, I'll jump back, 1860s, it was just sand, a mile across, a couple of inches deep, water. But because we had so changed the hydrology all the way throughout the watershed, a riparian forest was able to develop that came all the way up the Platte and South Platte rivers up to where, you know, where we are today. Uh, a lot of eastern um, United States species could migrate now up the river. It was no longer this wide braided stream, but a, a, a narrow channel that was lined with trees. So really dramatic change. And then here is a uh, oblique aerial photo uh, of that same area in 2017. It's thinned out a little bit since then, but still you have this braided channel, but it's really heavily vegetated. And this is because of all of the cumulative changes that we've done to the watershed since, uh, since the gold rush, essentially. <clears throat> Very close to the end here. Have to talk about Left Hand Ditch Company because that's here in in uh, Niwot and um, is really one of the key things. 1866, the ditch itself began in 1863. And that's the ditch that's up west of uh, Ward that takes the water from uh, the South St. Vrain over to James Creek. But the company itself wasn't incorporated until 1866. You know, think about it. They need water. They're going to go dig their ditch. 
and then worry about the niceties of organizing a ditch company. Uh, so that's what they did. Uh, but the ditch itself was originally built three years before they incorporated. And one of the big things that occurred, it was here in, in Left Hand Valley, was that uh, uh, Morskoff and Ru Ru Morskoff's brother Reuben had moved to uh, east of Longmont after the Civil War. And he noticed that there was a lot of these farms on Left Hand Creek and they were taking water. And down where he was, they weren't getting water. So they didn't really like that because they, they were being shut out. So Reuben and uh, a number of his buddies got it in their mind that they would ride up to the high country and tear out the diversion dam for Left Hand Ditch. So they did that. And uh, they went, it was a dry year, I think it was 1878. They went up to the mountains, tore out the diversion dam. And uh, the Left Hand Ditch Company noticed the day later that they didn't have any water. And so they kind of freaked out and said, there's something going on here. And they realized that Coffin and his buddies had torn out the diversion dam. So they got quite upset. And they uh, uh, hired an attorney out of Boulder called Richard Whiteley. And he was an interesting guy. He was an ex-Confederate uh, Army officer uh, from Georgia who uh, left Georgia and came to Colorado and got a law degree. And uh, they hired him to um, sue Coffin and those guys for stealing their water. So they did that. And they um, uh, had a, a trial in Boulder. Coffin and his friends uh, hired a gentleman out of uh, Longmont who uh, had lost his arm at Appomattox. So you had uh, a little bit of a north-south kind of uh, thing going on with the, with the attorneys. Anyhow, uh, the uh, left-hand ditch company prevailed, and the Coffin people um, appealed the case to the Colorado Supreme Court. And um, <clears throat> Chief Justice Elbert, You've heard of Albert, maybe, one of the peaks in Colorado. Uh, he was the son-in-law of one of the earliest uh, Colorado governors. And he ended up as the state Supreme Court justice. And he realized, this is kind of interesting, as one of the uh, oligarchs, in a sense, one of the early power players, he realized that if, if they allowed water to be used as it had been in the East Coast, which was you can own, if you can develop water rights based on riparian ownership. So if you had land along the river and diverted water only for that, you could essentially shut down all development in Colorado. So he realized that it would be very important uh, for Colorado's development to have an anti-corporate populist uh, ruling that would recognize a wide, widest possible use of water for the state. So he had an anti-corporate ruling. It had wide distribution of water. It affirmed that prior appropriation was the guiding doctrine in Colorado water law. And that in turn recognized the principle of first in time, first in right. So that's where you get your ditch priorities from. It recognized the right to move water away from the stream which included from ba river basin to river basin. And it recognized that uh, the location of use for water is not dependent on stream location. So there's very major things. That court case got replicated in the entire Western United States uh, and got, uh, it, it is the system of prior appropriation that happens all around the West. And all of that happened here in the, the Left Hand Valley first. So it's really a rather pretty cool thing historically that that little legacy is part of our legacy here in uh, the Left Hand Valley. Thank you. I wrote a book, if anyone is interested, the University Press of Colorado was good enough to publish it for me. And you can find copies of this at the Boulder Bookstore. And I plug them because they're our local bookstore. They have copies of it there in stock.
You can also find it on Amazon if you like to go that route and don't want to be out in public or directly through the University Press of Colorado. And this goes over um, a lot of the things that I talked about but in, in a, a little greater detail and uh, other, other stories and things like that about how water is run. So uh, if you enjoyed what I spoke about tonight, you might enjoy the book. Thank you. Very nice presentation, Bob. <laughs> sure appreciate it. I'm curious, how many ditches are there in Boulder County? I did a count once, and I came up with something like 200 or so incorporated ditches. But there's a lot more than that, and I'm really not sure because there's a lot of unincorporated ditches as well. There's the main ditches, you know, like our Silver Lake Ditch, your left-hand ditch, uh, which are the slightly bigger ones. But then there were a lot of other smaller ditches that got constructed. Many of those are no longer in existence. There were ditches that were built for some of the mining operations, the sluicing operations, and they had made claims there. There were other ditches that were built to run some of the timber down uh, to the creeks. So they actually had flume companies. And if you go up into the high country and are walking around, you'll see pieces of these things. Some of those had water rights, others did not. So there are a lot of those abandoned structures that are around Boulder Valley. Then there were also a whole series of seepage ditches that uh, got uh, claimed. <clears throat> so after the main ditches were appropriated, people, you know, and they were irrigating, suddenly these springs would dry, uh, pop up in dry gulches. And someone would figure out, oh, hey, I could make a claim on that. And so these secondary ditches as well started to get built. And uh, they had an adjudication back in the 1880s, and most of the early original um, you know, you know, pioneer, so-called pioneer, and some of the earliest corporate ditches were adjudicated then. But then in the early 1900s, a lot more of these small, you know, quarter mile, little seepage ditches got claimed. And, and there are dozens and dozens of those around. I really don't know the total number. Classic front range development. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, it, all of these kind of, kind of things that, that uh, you know, progress it. Uh, it's really interesting how, how a lot of that occurred. You know, and, you know as a, part of that, of course, uh, these little ditches were actually really rather important for, for a lot of small farms. Some of them are still in use today. Um, some of them have really unique water rights because they were seepage ditches and away from the main creeks. The, uh, there are a few decrees that say that they're not tributary to a creek. And so they, they can run outside of the prior appropriation system because they didn't think they were part of the regular creek. And so there's some interesting things with that as well uh, that go on. So yeah, there's, there's, some, there's quite a bit of stuff out there. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks very much. Bob, that's an awesome presentation. It's so interesting. Um, I have been told in uh, Niawat here that it has a high water table, and I don't know if it's unusually high, but uh, since you talked about the incredible changes of hydrology, I wonder if uh, are the, how much ditches in Niawat are contributing to that water table. Um, I would have to look at a specific area, but I think that really our, our water table is generally higher uh, after 150 years of use. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of irrigation that's gone on and it's elevated uh, the water table. You also see some fluctuations. Uh, I I'm, can tell a story on uh, Boulder Creek. One year when I was working for the city, uh, a person wanted to build a house downhill from a ditch. And I was out there, you know, we were talking about it. They had to put a little uh, bridge over the ditch. And I was out there with them and they said, oh, we're going to put in a basement. And I said, um, did you do a test bore? And they said, yeah, we did a test bore and there's no water there. And I said, when did you do a test bore? And, uh, <laughs> and they said, oh, well, back in January. And they said, well, you know, Tell you what, you do the test bore in July, 
and then decide whether or not you want to put <laughs> a basement in. And sure enough, the, the owner was standing there. And they heard that, and they did do a test bore in July, and they called back and said, wow, there's a really high water table here in the summer. <laughs> and that's because these ditches naturally seep. Now, now, an interesting thing, too, about that is, under state law, that natural seepage out of ditch, ditches, uh, you really can't sue a ditch company for that. That's a, that's a natural process. And they many, many court cases with some seepage that have caused some damage to homes. <clears throat> if it's natural seepage, it's not negligence from the ditch company. After all, the ditch company was there back in the 1860s, uh, before the United States government even owned the land. A lot of these people were squatting on Indian land. So, you know, putting a house there 150 years or so later, they should know that there's this seepage present. However, if you operate a ditch and the ditch bank blows out because of negligence uh, and fails catastrophically, that is indeed negligence. And when that happens, the ditch companies uh, are, are found negligent. So there's this, there's this interesting thing that goes on between you know, seepage and uh, ditch bank failure and all of this other stuff. Um, I think um, the ideas around you know, that, like that, management of ditch banks and easements is what's put more water attorneys' kids through college than almost any other water issue. Sure. <laughs> wow, it is so complicated. Yeah. In, in Niwot, we uh, get our water, our drinking water and, and water from a uh, left-hand ditch company. Uh, water District. Water District. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so from what you said earlier, it sounds like we're getting uh, drinking water from the uh, Fraser Basin and through that diversion of um, Grand Lake? Well, the, <clears throat> yeah, I'll clarify that a little bit. So the uh, Moffat Tunnel is the upper Fraser. Oh, okay. And that goes down to Denver. And then um, you have the Alva B. Adams Tunnel, which takes Colorado River water, and that provides it over to the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. So they run water out. Uh, the left-hand water district has uh, uh, what shares with what they call units in the, water, in the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. So they're able to utilize Colorado River water within the, uh, this area uh, as part of the water district's portfolio of water rights. And <clears throat> there are also farmers here that use that water to irrigate as well. And that's, that's, and that's, that's Colorado River water. They, that's you know, roughly over near uh, Windy Gap, over near um, Granby. Mm -hmm. that's, that's roughly where that's coming out of. And that's the tunnel that goes under Rocky Mountain National that's Park. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, big well, system. Long trip trip for our drinking water. Yeah, yes it is. Thank you. Sure. Bob, thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure and sure. lots of information. I cool. will enjoy watching the video. This video and any other videos are, uh, there are links on our website, niwathistoricalsociety.org. And otherwise, you can go to YouTube and type in the search engine of Niwot Historical Society, and there will be a list of presentations. Thank you very much to our video team, and have a good evening.